You can help to support us by clicking like and subscribing to our channel. The first transatlantic telegraph cable was installed in 1858. It only operated for a month, but it was replaced with a successful telegraph cable in 1866. Ninety years later, in 1956, the first transatlantic telephone cable system went into service. But from 1927 to 1956, the only transatlantic telephone service was over shortwave radio. This is the story of one of those radio telephone systems from 1940, a single sideband receiving system that used the most advanced technology of the day and an amazing array of 16 rhombic antennas stretching out for over two miles. <laughs> A businessman in London makes a call to America. C R U. Hello, Tramps? I want to make a call to America. His voice is put through from his local telephone exchange to the international switchboard at Faraday Building. To New York. I want to exchange. From there, it goes by landline to Rugby radio station. At Rugby, the voice is amplified 120 million times. It's carried from a shortwave transmitter to one of the arrays, or systems of aerials. New York is waiting. From the array, the voice is projected into the upper atmosphere in the direction of New York. This is Max. Max. I'm talking from London. I can't hear. The voice replying from New York Hello? is transmitted yeah. from Lawrenceville, Hello, New Jersey. But it isn't received at Rugby. Hello? Hello, yes? It Hi. comes over to Baldock, and thence back to Faraday House, where the two voices are put together as a conversation. Now, on their way over the Atlantic, these telephone voices meet various troubles. The electrical waves which carry the voices are reflected up and down between the surface of the earth and a layer of the atmosphere called the ionosphere. It's here that trouble begins because the ionosphere is continually shifting about and also fluttering. These movements are probably due to the sun. For example, when there are sunspots in the sun, the ionosphere flutters most. And then there's another trouble. Instead of the waves crossing the Atlantic by one path only, they split up along different paths. Any two paths will have slightly different lengths, and one wave will arrive after the other. And the result is that the two waves get slightly out of rhythm. Then, with the movement of the ionosphere, the amount that they're out of rhythm keeps on varying. But sometimes they add up, and sometimes they cancel right out. If they arrive at Baldock, at a moment when they are cancelling out, the voice fades away. So a new station is wanted, which will, in some way, overcome this fading, particularly since a big bunch of sunspots is expected in 1940. Down the Thames, opposite Canvey Island, there is a village called Cooling, which overlooks a big stretch of marshes. Here the engineers of the post office are already plotting the layout of a new receiving station to face exactly towards the Lawrenceville transmitters. They are going to employ the Muser reception system. A Muser, to begin with, consists of two miles of diamond-shaped aerials, 16 of them. The site for the aerials has to be right away from the interference of factories, cars on main roads, and radio transmitters. It has to be dead flat for the whole of the two miles. Cooling marshes have a variation of only a foot up or down, and the ground has to be wet to be a good conductor. The first work is to put up the central poles for the 16 aerials one every 220 yards for two miles.
Then, all the way down the line of poles, a trench has to be dug. This is to take underground cables back from the aerials to the receivers in the main building. Each cable really consists of two copper tubes, a little one inside a big one, with star-shaped insulators to keep them concentric. The tubes are taken out to the trench in 20-foot lengths. There are going to be 16 cables, one cable for each aerial. The longest of them two miles long, the shortest about 200 yards. So you can imagine how many joints there are to make. The jointing has to be a perfect job because the voice from America is going to pass down the tubes and mustn't pick up more troubles just before it gets home. For protection, the tubes and the outside of the joints are covered with bitumen and a sort of bandage. Then, before the cables are laid in their trench, each of the lengths is tested. When about 200 feet of each of the cables is ready, they are lifted up, one by one, and put down in the trench. Inside the station, they curl up out of the ground to be fitted to the receiving apparatus. The aerials are insulated and held up at four corners, since each aerial runs round four poles in a diamond. The aerial joins its cable at the top of the main pole of the diamond. The Musa system does not pretend to alter nature. The sun still has sunspots, the ionosphere still flickers. The waves are still out of rhythm. The waves come down from America at various angles. Let's take two and call them A and B. Actually, each wave is spread out over a front. That's why at cooling we have to have two miles of aerial. It's obvious that the front does not hit all the aerials at the same time. Also, it has different lengths of cable to run along. So that from the furthest aerial, it takes longest to reach the end of the cable. At the end of the cables, Musa puts a series of boxes, which act as brakes, and hold up the first arrivals till the last ones have had time to catch up. The bees come down late. They hit the aerials at a steeper angle. The hold-up at the ends of the cables is greater than it was for the A's. The bees divert into a set of bee break boxes. Here then we have the two waves, A and B, received separately. They are still out of rhythm, but now they can be combined and put into rhythm. In fact, just as they left America. Thanks to Musa, Cooling Post Office radio station is going to be important not only for the reply voice in long-distance business calls, but also for receiving radio broadcasts from America. America, the opening speech by President Roosevelt. We are now taking you over to the United States. A few days ago... A whisper, fortunately untrue, raced around the world that armies standing over against each other in unhappy array were about to be set in motion. Your businessmen and ours felt it alike. Your farmers and ours heard it alike. 
your young men and ours wondered what effect this might have on their lives. Instead, we in the Americas have become a consideration to every propaganda office and to every general staff beyond the seas. The vast amount of our resources, the vigor of our commerce, and the strength of our men have made us vital factors in world peace, whether we choose it or not.